All right, thank you everybody for coming out to our presentation. Um, this is uh, the three of our senior projects. We're trying to make an autonomous vehicle that is driven by a now robot. Um, I'm Joe. I'm Dirk Kaplowitzko. I'm Sam. Yeah, and then our advisor who could not make it today is Dr. Kim. He's ECD faculty here at TCNJ. Okay, cool. So just to kind of give you an overview of what we'll be covering today, um, we're just going to start with some background and general goals that we had for the project before we kind of go into how we designed our system. Um, we'll talk about some of the technical components we use, such as the microcontroller, uh, some of the drivers and motors, and the sensors as well. Then we'll transition into some of the mechanical aspects of the vehicle before diving into the now robot, what they're going to be using to navigate uh, Armstrong Hall, which is kind of the scope of our robot, and then how that was all trained in the end. So for background, uh, this project was a legacy project last um, worked on in 2016. Um, they created a smart car system with an owl robot um, that would steer mechanically. Uh, we evaluated the effectiveness, effectiveness of the current technology for autonomous vehicles. Um, and we also had a personal interest in robotics and machine so the goals of our vehicle was to navigate Armstrong Hall, and we wanted the robot, the now robot, to identify different rooms um, along the hallways um, and communicate its findings to the people around it. It should also dynamically navigate around obstacles, so humans, trash cans, anything that could be in the hallways, doors open. Um, so our specifications was to have a base plate of 99.44 centimeters by 60.96 centimeters by 0 0.1 centimeters. So the base plate is two feet by three feet. Um, and then we have four buttons for steering, um, left and right, and then also to drive forwards and backwards. And then we have sensors in six major positions to detect obstacles and also to fall along the right wall of Armstrong Hall. And then um, a chassis to support the weight of the now robot. So the system design, all of the components we put together kind of start at the sensors. The sensors are what allow our robot to navigate uh, any amount of space at all. So once some data comes in from those, they go into the microcontroller. And the microcontroller is responsible for making the decision. Um, it's where the, our main algorithm for determining which direction to go is programmed. And then ultimately that sends a command to the now robot through a serial connection so that it can know which buttons to press and the buttons feedback into the car steering system and determine whether the motors get powered forward or they step left and right. And the microcontroller of choice that we use for this project was an Arduino Mega. Uh, as you can see from the diagram, there are a lot of different pins available. Uh, some of them are for power. We're providing power through an external battery. It needs uh, about 12 volts in in order to support both the battery and all the extra, or not the battery, to support the motor and all the extra peripherals. And then some of those are rated at five volts, which has a separate pin in order to control that voltage. And there's a voltage regulator in there to make sure we don't burn out any peripheral components. And then most of what happens with the button communication is through general purpose input and output pins for sending digital and analog signals. And lastly, in order to control the speed of the vehicle, we're using a pulse width modulation set of pins that allow us to be more careful and specific about how fast we're going in the hallways. And then when it comes to the driver motor, one of our spin-off components from the main microcontroller, there's a few different settings here for uh, supplying some power for the logic circuitry, supplying some power for the battery, as well as controlling not only the speed, like I mentioned earlier, but also the direction forwards and backwards that the motor will be spinning. And as mentioned before, we are using ultrasonic sensors. We do have six of them around the vehicle at the moment. And what the point of the sensors is to do is collect the data from the vehicle to the wall to make it drive straight. And if there's something in front of the, uh, the sensor, it'll go around the vehicle. The diagonal sensor is in the top left and top right. If there's open space, it will see the open space and make that right turn or left turn as needed. And we decided to use ultrasonic sensors as opposed to infrared or LIDAR just because these are much more affordable. They're easy to use, fast response times, and 
for our budget, it was just the best uh, sensors. So for the stepper motor controls, which controls the front wheel steering, um, we used a stepper NEMA 17, um, and then we had to purchase an extra driver to be able to control it. Um, so for the driver, we have it set at 400 steps per revolution, and then we limit the current to two amps because that is what the stepper motor is able to handle. And then we use the direction and pulse on the stepper driver, but we do not use enable uh, for this configuration. And then that uh, communicates with the Arduino uh, Mega, and then the buttons also control the stepper motor um, through the Arduino. This is the mechanical design of the chassis. So we had to redesign it to fit the single front wheel because it was originally two front wheels. Um, so we have cutouts for the back wheels, a cutout for the front wheel, and then we have angled aluminum that reinforces underneath since we went with a thinner aluminum base to cut down on weight. So here's just a close up of the stepper motor of the front wheel design. So we have a wheel connected to a wheel fork and then the wheel fork comes up and is attached to a larger gear. Um, the stepper motor is attached to a smaller gear and that gear ratio going from smaller to larger adds increased torque. So we wanted to make sure that the front wheel would be able to turn while moving. Uh, and then that's just the hub we had for connecting it to the base. And then here are just some images of the now sitting inside the car um, with all our wiring components. And then we had to design an outside because we wanted to visually look like a car as well. So then you could see kind of the button dashboard and then now is able to reach out and press the buttons that will control the steering and driving. And right here is just a quick description of how now, uh, now Robert looks like in which it has the cameras, it has a microphone, it has speakers, it has a power button in the middle, batteries inside, and then it also has bumpers. And on top of its head and also some of the feet itself, there's like little bumps in which they could actually do some type of uh, action that we want to do, like look at a picture or just anything else like that. And here's how we're going to be identifying some rooms using the cameras itself on the now camera or on the now robot. It has a feature called learn in which if we put a picture in front of its uh, camera, we could draw a boundary around it and just give it a tag. Like on the right hand side, I have it named as room 124. So if I were to have that picture put in front of its face, it will say this is room 124. So when the car is going around the places, we can make it stop at a specific room and the now robot will turn its head and say, this is room 124 and if there's any events in that room as well. Yeah. And then when it comes to navigation, uh, we are using a reinforcement learning algorithm in order to teach the robot how to steer around the hallway. So this is done through Pygame. It's a Python library for making games. And games are the most popular format for doing reinforcement learning because you can just have the computer simulate multiple playthroughs very quickly. And by kind of designing your own uh, game or simulation in that environment, you can train through multiple repetitions very quickly and easily. So after kind of initializing the simulation and running it, um, there's a map that I'll show later that displays a simplified version of the Armstrong hallway. For those who aren't familiar with the building, Armstrong is literally one big loop um, with like one or two small branch outs. So the car right now is trained to kind of go around a loop. And then once that algorithm is in a state that is stable and able to navigate in a simulated environment, that's when we uh, do some manipulation to it and upload it into the microcontroller, which will allow it to drive in real time in a physical environment. So overall, we are trying to get our now robot to drive this vehicle using a combination of some mechanical tooling and machining and concepts to design physical hardware in the vehicle. And we're also incorporating some electronic design with the sensors as a way to get information in and out of the robot and applying some software and machine learning as well in order to teach it how to drive safely without crashing into things. Yeah, that's basically it for the main presentation. We also have a couple of short demo videos that we're gonna show um, about our progress so far. So this first video was courtesy of Dirk. He uh, recorded a successful run of our robot kind of navigating down the main hallway outside of our lab in Armstrong. Yeah.
So to start, I just kind of put the negative connector into the breadboard. And as you can see, the car is moving straight. And then once it notices an object in front of it, I believe I have it around 100 centimeters. It will make a left turn and then recenter itself to keep going straight. And then it will keep going straight until there's a large enough area to make that right turn. So I have like around 200 centimeters. It'll make that right turn. And then it will keep going straight again. And we're going to keep doing that same process around Armstrong Hall to just make it go around the full loop. And then we also have a video of what one of those training simulation looks like. Again, it's a fairly simplified version just because the longer versions with a little bit more detail take longer to train. Um, but this is just an example of how you can see multiple different generations of the car try navigating the loop. And every time one gets a little bit further, it saves that information and knowledge of how it did that and transfers it to the next generation. And this process repeats over and over until it can navigate without crashing for a sufficiently long time, um, which for the simulation purposes was set to around 30 seconds. Now, when it came to some more complex maps, like an Armstrong, sometimes you'll have an open door, so it'll look like there's an off branch, or not like you saw in the video, there was one hallway that kind of went out as an extra branch. Those sorts of things can absolutely be trained. They just take a lot longer and wouldn't have fit in the presentation. But um, all of that is capable with enough time spent um, and tweaking of the algorithm to make it uh, recognize the right features in the hallway. Yeah, and then these are just some references we use, but uh, other than that, we are open to questions. A question a little bit later. Sure. Um, in the video of the car driving, I didn't see the robot in it. Are those two separate projects? So for the time that we, when we took the video, um, the car wasn't complete with the dashboard. Mm -hmm. um, so when we make the next video, we'll have um, the buttons working. The next step would just be them to take the sensor info and then give it to Arduino. And then Arduino would communicate to the now robot. And then the now robot would then press the buttons to navigate. But just for the purposes of doing a demo for this presentation, we just have the sensors communicate directly and then that directly communicate to the wheel. That's all to do. Yeah, the, as the communication of it is where the components on the car could theoretically make the decision on its own because the now doesn't have the computing power to be able to do that. Um, so it would just be an intermediate step of instead of directly sending the command to the motor, it sends the command to the robot who hits the button and then that communicates with the motor. Are you sending the raw data to your training algorithm or is there any filtering at all on the mega? Um, on the mega we are not doing filtering. Um, so it's using a classifier. So based on the simulation, if you look at the individual cars, they have like the little green wire shooting out to simulate what kind of data is coming in from a sensor. Um, if we end up getting a lot of false readings on the um, through the sensors, then there are some normalization algorithms that can detect like oh, how come we suddenly went from like 400 centimeters, 400 centimeters, 40 centimeters, 400 centimeters. Um, I've looked into some pre-processing algorithms. I can combat that, but we haven't encountered that problem yet. Yeah, it's just like any other kind of digital filter uh, you could implement. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of having car communicate with the Arduino and the Arduino push button? No. Yeah, the robot yeah, pushing the button. Right. Um, is there something about, like, what are you trying to prove with that? Why? Yeah, why have the robot? It's like, it seems like you would need it, but you're doing it. So there's got to be a reason why. So the robot is in there in one practical sense um, because of the built in cameras for the room mm -hmm. recognition, and it adds like okay. a nice kind of human machine interaction component. Um, in terms of the practical driving experience, that's just like an exercise in seeing if we can get it to do it instead of the car directly. So the, the, the robot's providing the cameras the car uses to figure out where it is? Yeah, when it ultimately 
because the the goal in some sense is to have it be sort of like a guide around the building for people and so like Dirk was mentioning with the detection with the room numbers um, that's where the robot really comes into play Yeah. How do you um your boundary? How do you tell a robot what buttons to push and like have does a robot have like finger sensors to know that it's a button, you know? Yeah, so using the software called Choreograph using the robot, I could change or when it's on, I could make it press certain buttons when it gets a certain uh signal. So having all the information from the Arduino, Joe's gonna be working on to connect the Arduino to the now. So the now senses a type of uh object in front of it, it will press or slam its hand on that one button. To make that left turn, to go right, front, and go like that. You yeah. kind of pre program it to do certain hand movements. Okay. So we have the button set in specific spots so we could program it if it rests in the middle of the tube to move up and over. Okay. And then when it gets, oh, there's an object here, we have to turn this direction, it could just send and it could automatically do play, hit, right button, far right button, hit, middle right button. It'll just have like a predetermined set motion. So it'll automatically know every single time where the button is. Um, we don't have it currently where it does like live time. Oh, here's the button. I'm identifying it. Then I'll press it. Um, yeah. So it'll just be predetermined. Yeah, because it has a, the dashboard is in a fixed location. The robot is in its fixed location in the seat. So it's easy enough to pre-program that action. I don't have a question. Like, is it actually, uh, I'm a statement. Mm -hmm. uh, I did watch it with the last artificial intelligence, and I see the connection. I see that you guys pick the right career first. You work in this chauffeurs or drivers. It was a good song for Thank you. Thank you. All right, I guess we'll let the next group take some time to set up, but mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much for coming thank out. You.